Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to this AWARE webinar on the impact of chronic illness on psychological well-being. We're just going to take a few moments now to allow people to join in. So take a minute to get settled and we'll get going shortly. All right, so you're all very welcome again. Oh, my name is Dr. Susan Brannock. I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical director with AWARE. Our topic today is the impact of chronic illness on psychological well-being. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by my guest speakers this afternoon, Dr. Susan O'Flanagan and Victoria Spillan. A warm welcome to you both. Thanks for joining today. So just before we get going, a brief note on AWARE. So as you, many of you will know, we do these webinars on the second Wednesday of every month, talking about a range of mental health topics. And we offer uh, support services to people with living with depression, bipolar and anxiety conditions. So please do have a look at our website for more information on that area. So as I said, our topic today is the impact of chronic illness on psychological well-being. So just briefly to say chronic illness and what it is. So we might understand that as a long-term condition that people will live with for many years, maybe with symptoms persisting. Um, people may have periods of wellness, times of where the illness is more active. So we really, really welcome any questions you might have on our topic this afternoon. So we'll try to get to the, as many of them as we can. Um, we may not get to all of them. So if you're left with any questions after our discussion today, do have a look at our website and maybe talk to your team or to your GP. So without further ado, I'm very happy, as I said, to introduce Dr. Susan Flanagan and Victoria. So maybe if I'll ask you both just to briefly uh, introduce yourselves and then we'll get going into the topic. Susan, I'll start with you, maybe. Thanks, Susan. And uh, yeah, thanks to you and to AWARE for inviting me to be part of this discussion today. I'm just so thrilled that this topic has been talked about. I'm, I'm really thrilled to share this space with both yourself and Victoria. Um, so really warm welcome to everybody. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist uh, and I currently work in the Matter Hospital in Dublin in the area of psycho-oncology. But for the best part of the last 10 years, I've worked in acute hospital settings and worked with people with a range of different chronic illnesses. And um, so I've worked with people with cancer, I've worked with people with HIV, and I've worked with people with infectious diseases like long COVID. Um, and also outside of those conditions, there's lots of people with multiple health conditions at the same time. So certainly a really wide range of, of chronic health conditions. Um, and I suppose my main passion is really um, thinking about the fact that a chronic illness impacts a whole person's life. And so really passionate about hospitals and healthcare, taking a holistic approach uh, towards a person's well-being and their health. Um, and, you know, really thinking about the impact on the whole person and the impact on someone's psychology and how psychology can uh, be influenced by chronic health and how chronic health can uh, influence our psychology as well. So really glad to be part of this conversation today. That's brilliant. Thanks, Susan. And Victoria, if I could get you to introduce yourself briefly as well. Sure. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, it's And welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of the middle of your day as well. I know it's not easy. Um, so I am a research support officer at APC Microbiome Ireland, which is based in University College Cork. We, a lot of the research that's done here focus on kind of gut health and the microbiome um, and brain gut access, um, everything that, you know, just to, to figure out um, how things can be caused and how to make things better for people. Um, I, I'm also on the board of directors for Crohn's Colitis Ireland, because um, I think most importantly, the hat that I wear is a, an IBD warrior as I put it, because um, I have Crohn's disease for the last 24 years. Um, and I live with an ileostomy, a permanent ileostomy as well, which I've had for the last 12 years. Um, so I can wear many hats in life, but again, like Susan, I um, you know, I'm aware that there's a lot more chronic illnesses out there. I have a background as well um, in kind of social work and social care. So I have helped others, you know, live through different um illnesses and all that, you know. So it's I I'm I'm well astute to to what it's like to, you know, from caring for someone to having to care for myself as well with a chronic illness. Um, and yeah, just again to, to echo Susan, it's just my passion is to just continue to bring awareness 
to these to, to such an issue and I think you can talk all day about you know just living with a disease to an extent but I think that the psychological aspect can go amiss at times so I think that such a webinar like today is vitally important. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Victoria. And thank you both for, for being here today. It's definitely a topic I think that's going to be of interest to, to a lot of people. And as you say, Victoria, certainly it, it can often get missed, the psychological aspects. So we'll talk kind of a bit more about that. And I suppose thinking about the, the things that people might run into in their journey living with a chronic condition. And I suppose thinking about our conversation today, maybe a good place to start is, is so almost kind of near the beginning in a way of that kind of initial phase of... I suppose, getting a diagnosis. And that can be, I know, certainly in my experience of working uh, with people living with IBD, that can be a very long lead in or it can be very short. And obviously people come with very different life experiences to what that might be. So maybe if I start with you, Susan, maybe if you might be able to talk through a bit about what you've seen kind of in your work in terms of that first initial stage of adjustment and, and I suppose getting your head around something that's really life changing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a good place to start, I think, for today. Um, I think first and foremost, it's really important to say that getting a diagnosis of a chronic health condition is one of the most stressful experiences that a person will face in their life. And not just the individual person, but the family as well. Um, and I think, as you said, Susan, for some people, there might be quite a long lead in, you know, they might have some symptoms and a constellation of symptoms and maybe have some idea of, of what they're going to be diagnosed with. And for other people, it can come as a complete shock, you know, an incidental finding, a blood test that shows something up. So a real bolt out of the blue. Um, and even for people who have some inkling that something is going to happen, it's very, very different having a kind of cognitive and a thought that something is going to happen versus the lived reality of actually been told this is a fact. So I think first when we think about adjustment, it's really, really important to think about the person prior to their diagnosis of a chronic illness. So we don't come into this as a blank slate. You know, we come into it at a particular life stage. For so, so for some people, they're in, in young adolescence um, and they have lots of tasks and goals and, and things that they want to achieve in life and haven't got the opportunity to do so yet. And for other people, you know, maybe they have done many tasks in their life and, and they're at a later life stage. So people come into it at different life stages. They come into it with different personalities, with different coping styles, with different experiences of mental health. Um, they come into it with financial resources or not, with social resources or not. And all of these things really influence how somebody adjusts. And when we think about the territory of adjustment, I think it's one of the things that's most important to say is that it's not a one size fits all. Um, so when I meet with people who have had a recent diagnosis of, of a chronic health condition, I can really come across a variety of responses. So for some people, they might experience a lot of anger towards their medical team or the people themselves. Some people might actually be in denial and, and not have taken in information. Some people might be experiencing a lot of anxiety and worry, sadness, shame, guilt. So there's a real continuum of emotions that can happen for people. Um, and I think it's really important to say that they don't happen in neat stages um, and that adjustment isn't really, um, it's not one time only experience. I think pe when people think about adjustment, they think about that time when a diagnosis comes. But what we know about a chronic health condition is that you're constantly adjusting over time to new teams, to new systems, to you know, new medications, to um, maybe news that your disease has worsened. So I think really important as well to think that adjustment isn't a one-time only piece. Um, and in many ways, I often say to people, it's like learning a new language. You know, you're not meant to know how to do this and that it really does take time to adjust. Um, so very often people kind of want to rush that and move to acceptance or been OK with what's happening for them. Um, but the lived reality is for many people that adjustment, it does take time um, and people can go through a lot of different emotions, a lot of different thoughts and a lot of different experiences over that time. 
and it's all it's all normal isn't it I guess I would really echo that like whatever you're feeling is 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 kind of okay and it might it might be difficult but it's you're going to experience a whole range of things that are going to be really different for different people based on on who you individually are Victoria I wonder does that kind of resonate with your experiences or similarities or differences in what you what you see well, I was diagnosed when I, I was getting sick when I was 13 um, and it just came out and over. It was a pain at the end of my back and my left knee. So I was a very active girl, um, was playing basketball, just just loved being out and about, was going to the GP. Um, so I just a basketball injury, went on for ages. It, it took a good 12 months to get diagnosed because I kept going back. My parents kept bringing me, knew there was something wrong. But, you know, and I just kept going with it. I think I just got used to, you know, I'd have a high threshold of pain. And I think just because I just put up with it, you know, it's one of those things where you end up living, you make something normal in your life that isn't, that you shouldn't have to make a normality. Um, and then other symptoms of Crohn's disease came on. You know, there was the frequent diarrhea, the weight loss, the severe abdomen pain, all that eye issues, every joint issues, everything that, that could possibly be there with Crohn's, I was getting those symptoms. Um, the GP just kept saying, was I being bullied? You know, was there this going on? Did I have an eating disorder? It's like, no, I, I was even saying I'm trying to eat. I just can't. I'm getting sick and whatnot. Um, so it was. I was I, I was just I was always kind of stubbornly determined ever since I was a child. So it was a case of, OK, I'm I, I, I just got on. And it was just like I just automatically 30 went into survival mode. It was like, I just want to keep going to school. I was very academic, very ambitious. And I think that kept me going and I had a fabulous support network with my family. So that did help having that support network um, where they were fight. I saw them fighting the doctor for me as well. You know, so I was like, OK, they were giving me strength to then be able to stand up for myself as well in the doctors and say, look, I am here. I know I'm a child, but I'm here. Listen to what I'm saying. I need to. There's something wrong. Um, and yeah, I eventually got diagnosed and it was tough. It was tough. Um, and but and. I was such a severe case that I was supposed to have my large intestine fully removed immediately once I got the diagnosis. Um, so I was that person and I just said, look, I don't care. They said, you'll get a bag. And I said, I don't care. I just wanted to be better. At that stage, I was just after my Christmas exams and I was just very conscious of the fact that I, I wasn't able to do my maths test and I wasn't able to do this and do that. So I think I put my focus automatically on something else to be able to get me through. And I think that's kind of what I've found in life from having lived so long with a chronic illness is that that's what I tend to do to cope I think a lot of the time is that I will focus on something else to push through that moment survival mode get to the end and then I think at times it's like okay I've dealt with that I've, I've gotten through it but you do go through a grieving process then I feel afterwards you know we go through your survival mode which is fabulous if you can get through it which I, I feel everyone can even on days where you feel you can't you can get through it but I think then it's you know when everything dies down you could be in remission um or whatever else is going on in your life that you have to kind of fight through and I think it's almost you go through a grieving process at that stage and that's what I found as I got was able to get into remission after a while I was questioning why me why did I get this you know how has this happened why hasn't someone else in my family gotten it why don't my friends because back then inflammatory bowel disease wasn't commonly known like it is now so I was going to school with people who didn't have a clue there was adults who didn't have a clue um so it was, it was, it was looking back, I'd say, you know, people say you're a warrior, I fight, I'm strong. And I get that I am. And I, to me, I can get through any situation, but it does wear you down. And it did wear me down at times. I had to go through my teenage years. That's, you know, when I was diagnosed and it was incredibly hard. You put on medication, completely changes your appearance, everything like that. So it's, you know, you've comments thrown at you. So you have to fight through not just getting yourself well, but you're fighting through comments that you might hear your peers making, adults which makes it worse when you're a kid you're saying how can an adult make such a comment about a child's appearance you know things like that so it, you do go definitely go through the grieving process I think that's all part of it and eventually like I did accept having a chronic illness quite well to be honest especially for being so young because I educated myself on it and I just wanted to know like what is this um so that did help you know, doing my research on it and speaking, I did have a fantastic gastro a gastro team, which did help. Um, so, and I was always that inquisitive, but why, but why? And like, what, why is this part inflamed and why is there ulcers there? And how is this, how is this working? I probably wrecked their heads for a while, but um, I, I was just inquisitive and that's just what I'm like in general. So 
I think as an inquisitive person, I think that I've, I've seen others with chronic illness that it, it can help as well, you know, that you do, you do find out as much as you possibly can. And that does help you cope as well. Yeah. But it is the grieving process, definitely, that I did find that I had to go through. Um, and especially when I had my intestine removed eventually, because I didn't have it. They, they put me on medication. They were able to save it. Um, so it, it was 12 years later when I got it removed. So that was certainly a grieving process, because to me, it was the death of a body part. I just had to go, you know, and it was to save my life at the end of the day because I was such a severe case. Um, if I didn't have it two weeks later, I, I wouldn't have been here. Um, there was, I had a growth that was leaking that went undetected, basically. Um, they found it during the surgery. So it's, I count my blessings every day that, that the surgery was done, but I did have to go through that. And I think it's like with anyone with a chronic illness, you know, when you are diagnosed and again, as you say, Susan, it's not one size fits all. And anyone, whether it's IBD, it could be a totally, completely different chronic illness. Um, we're the same, but different, you know, and it's it's a case of everything that we, we can all resonate with how we might feel. And I would like people to say you're a very positive person and that's fine. And someone else might be as positive, but I've had my days where I haven't been. And I think recently, again, I've had to go back into the cycle of lupus is after being thrown my way. So it's a case of now starting something else now again on top of it's like one autoimmune on top of another. So, you know, it's mm. just trying to, I had been well for so long after um, having my surgery. Last year, things kicked off. I know it's to try to get back into the mindset of survival, but because I'm older, I'm a lot more aware. It's like, don't just go full survival, go through the actual processes of yeah. accepting it um, while I'm surviving, which can I be, think that's, yeah. That can be I think that, yeah I th I, it sounds it sounds like such a journey Victoria it's, yeah and thank you for sharing that because I'd say what you're saying really resonates with people and as you say the kind of the stages of it which maybe you both sort of said and it's not a one-size-fits-all and you might get to a place with something and then something else happens and you start a process again and that's really tough isn't it but and as you said there are loads of things that help in that it also makes me think a bit about what you were saying there it's such a big task isn't it in diagnosis so you're having to figure out this new condition all the medical stuff that goes with that, your own body, that was maybe like, as you said, maybe for you kind of a longer lead in, which is difficult. So then having to navigate a health system where people are like, that comes up a lot in IBD, doesn't it? Like, oh, there must yeah. be something else. And you're like, well, no, actually this is, this is it. And this is, and yeah. it takes a long time to get there. So you're looking at navigating a health system, mm -hmm. complex medical situation, your own body and how you can cope with that. So it's really helpful to kind of hear, as you said, the things that you find really, really helpful. And, and maybe Susan, to go back to you in terms of things that you've noticed also help people in this stage age of that kind of adjustment and diagnosis the sort of takeaways maybe for people mm -hmm. yeah and just reflecting on what Victoria said like I love how much you brought yourself to your chronic illness you know that the, all of those parts of your coping style and your personality um, and all of those strengths that you have um, now they don't take away all of the difficulty and there's still going to be days where that's really challenging but I just really hear that that really helped and brought you through so I think that piece around even for people reflecting on their strengths reflecting on other difficulties that they had in life you know what did I do to help me through that mm -hmm. did I need informational support did I need social support did I need psychological support and um, did I need practical and to really think about our own internal resources but also to think about what's around us and, and what we can kind of engage with to help us through such a difficult time that that as Victoria explained isn't a, a one-time only piece but that might kind of emerge again and again. I think in terms of, of in that adjustment period which might happen a number of times I think a couple of really important points around that are really what we can do when we're suffering or when we're struggling is we can add layers to that as human beings so we can often kind of say I shouldn't feel like that or uh, I should be able to accept this and um, you know I should be further on uh, I shouldn't be grieving you know so we give ourselves kind of rules and and we add extra suffering to our experience and we can get very entangled in our thoughts and so I think the message really that I often give to people is to allow um, whatever is coming up for them.
to allow whatever thoughts are there, to allow what feelings are there, and to think about what do I need to support myself in this. Um, and that can be a much more helpful way of approaching struggling rather than adding extra layers to it. And I think one of the other things that I often see people do is that um, the goal of adjustment really is to get used to a new reality. Mm -hmm. um, and a new way of living and a new way of being but often what I see people do is trying to go back to their life exactly as it was before but with all these changes that have happened and and I suppose the pieces I've seen people do that time and time again and and they just fail um because things have changed and none of us as human beings we don't want change you know we resist it we push it away we don't want it it's uncomfortable it's difficult um, but actually, what I often find is that if we can be with how things are now and make accommodations and adjustments to how we are in this moment, it can be more helpful. And often I kind of compare it to like playing a game of cards. Um, so we don't want to play a game of cards with a hand that we had, you know, a while ago. We need to play the game of cards with the hand that we have right now. So that looking at the here and now um, and really looking at the supports around you that can help you to adjust is, is a really important starting point yeah it's, thank you thank you both there's I mean I think we could nearly have the whole webinar on even this phase of of getting your head around a chronic conditions there's a lot in there isn't there in terms of yes. I would really echo that Susan and Victoria too that they kind of as you said bringing your whole self but also the allowing of what feels really difficult which is which is really tricky, you know, I guess we can say things here in this conversation, but actually it's really hard when you're doing it. So kind of, I, I guess, bringing that self-compassion to it too. Um, we do have a few questions coming in, so I'm going to try to get to these as we talk, but I guess there's a couple of areas maybe it'd be kind of good to get to, maybe even just following on from what we're saying here about kind of what you were saying, Susan, too, about the additional layers of struggle. So mm -hmm. most people, and I guess, Victoria, as you kind of testament to, you kind of go through these things and come out the other end and find that equilibrium. But but also there can be difficulties, kind of mood and, and anxiety can interact with, with long-term conditions. And it can be really, it can be really complicated, can't it? So mm -hmm. certainly... Um, if we think about trying to tease that apart, you know, so maybe feeling kind of sleep is really affected, you're not eating, um, so appetite might be kind of gone out the window, not enjoying stuff, feeling quite quite tired. They can be symptoms of, of many long-term conditions, but they can also be signs of depression, can't they? So I guess it's um, it's trying to unpack a bit what might be going on for you individually. So I guess, and what we know maybe is that people living with long-term conditions or chronic illness are two to three times more likely to develop difficulties with, with depression or anxiety. And that's because it's it's so complex. Um, Susan, I wonder if you might say a little bit maybe on, on how someone might kind of identify or kind of look at start of kind of unpacking that a bit. So how they might kind of figure out, is this kind of, my disease being very active or actually am I feeling quite low or is it what would be the kind of signs or what could help there do you think oh I think it's I think it's such a good question I'm so glad it's come up and um, because it's what um comes into the therapy room often and uh, when people come in to see me and I think as you said Susan like the majority like so like probably two thirds of people will reach an equilibrium. Um, and, and what we know is that even in that equilibrium after, after a difficult experience or, or that period of adjustment, you will have days where you're feeling down and you will have days where you're feeling more anxious. So I suppose, firstly, to differentiate that, that kind of moods, and as Victoria said, they are bound to be affected and they are bound to go up and down when you are dealing with such a lot. Um, so I suppose that kind of piece, just to normalize that first, that people will experience maybe periods of, of low mood or anxiety um, and that they will likely ebb and flow depending what's happening with your illness and in your life. But for a third of people, they will have, have more difficulties and will experience maybe anxiety or depression or panic and um, among other um, mental health conditions as well. Um, and as you said, Susan, like a, a physical illness, and I think Victoria touched into this, that there's a lot of themes, regardless of what illness we're talking about. And I'm sure there's people joining us with real variety and continuum of illnesses today. There is going to be common themes. So physical illness is going to affect our sleep. It's going to affect our appetite. It's going to affect our libido. It's going to affect 
um, our energy levels. But all of those things are things that we look out for if we're monitoring for mood and mental health as well. So often what I would go to is that I would think about not just the physical experiences that can overlap or be intertwined between a physical illness and mental health, but I would also just be thinking about feelings and thinking about thoughts. So say, for instance, if we took an experience of depression, and um, maybe I'd be asking someone not about their energy, not about their sleep, they're important too, but really to hone in, I'd probably be thinking about, you know, what, what is your thought process like? You know, are you having a lot of negative thoughts about yourself, about your future, about other people around you? Are you feeling more irritable? Are you feeling a sense of dread? Are you feeling more hopeless? So I think what's really important when we're monitoring our own mental health in the midst of a, a chronic health condition is that we're kind of teasing apart look, what's normal as a result of the physical illness, but also that piece of, of monitoring, you know, how am I doing from an emotional point of view and how am I doing from a cognitive point of view? What are my thoughts like as well? So I think differentiating those two is really, really important. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really helpful. And I think maybe if there's any, excuse me, I guess healthcare professionals that aren't in medical set or aren't in hospital settings, that's a good kind of way to frame it as well. Maybe GP or other kind of mental healthcare professionals. So trying to make sense of it through that different lens as well. So because it is, it is complicated, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Victoria, I wonder whether that kind of resonates with you or, or your kind of experiences in that. Or again, what's it does, it? and I think especially most recently, you know, again, I suppose in one sense, I look, look, I try to look at all situations that arise in life whether it is chronic illness or the hundred other things that I've kind of gone through and one of those people I say I could write a book at this stage um not just about chronic illness mm. but it's like that you know it's forever getting through stuff but it's I'm always I always try to find something to be grateful for with anything I'm actually experiencing whether it is it, it is an illness or whether it could be a divorce or it could be miscarriages it could be whatever it might be I always look for and I know I might annoy some people but that's just I always find if you can just find some little bit of a silver lining and that can help because I think that then helps for the next thing that that comes your way. I mean, this is the, the joys of life. There's always going to be something, you know, whether it's now or it's something might not have hit yet. It could be 10 years down the line. It's just to and it'll tie in with resilience. I know that we might speak on that later. Um, but I do find that I think this year has been a very particularly tough year for me. I lost my grandmother, who was my biggest support. Basically, she was like a second mother to me. So that was incredibly hard. And I think that with getting kind of, you know, lupus thrown at me, I did actually think, how am I getting through this without her? Do you know this? Because she was always my go to to come to hospital appointments and do this and do that. Um, so it's this year has been completely new for me in, in one sense, because I, you know, as I said earlier, always surround yourself with with a good support network. And this is the you now I still have a fabulous family, but she was just such a strong person in my life. I'm like, OK, that that strength is gone. I know this is like a new journey for me now again, you know, and again, and it's adjusting again. It's a, it's a readjustment of how am I now coping this year with another illness? You know, um, I'm caught. It's obviously it's a different illness quite similar symptoms with regards to joints and things like that which is why there was a bit of an overlap what was it was a Crohn's active again what was it so it's taken a while um but it was just to try to readjust to Susan said you know you have to constantly kind of readjust the situations and I do feel that this year I've seen down and said am I depressed or is it just because I don't feel well what is it and I did actually sit down and say okay and I, I did do that because I, you know, it was just the case of I'm just I've been through so much in life. I sat down. I actually remember sitting down at home one day and I said, OK, and I just looked out the window. I'm in a new house with my partner or little puppy, the whole lot. And I said, everything is great. Yes, Nana isn't here, but she's she went through a lot herself. So she's at peace now. And I was like, OK, that's how I will come to terms with that. But now, am I actually depressed because of everything that's happened or is it just the illness? And I, I was actually just thinking I was framing my thoughts, you know, and it was like, no, I actually am, bar how I'm feeling, you know, I, I, I just had this fatigue constant and it was just it aches and pains and I just had no interest in doing much, if anything, you know, and I, I, I would just sit down and say, I'll read a book later and say, and I'd never get to read the book. I'd be just sitting there. I could just be staring at the TV and say, am I depressed or what is it? Or is it just, um, and then I would say, no, I'm actually grateful and I actually am happy. You know, when I sat down and like sat with my thoughts, it's like I actually am happy in life. So I, I did come to the conclusion it is just what I'm actually going through with the chronic illness right now. You know, I was able to, in my head, 
say, okay, I'm not actually depressed right this minute, but I'm actually, I'm just going through a lot with my body and it's just making me feel that way. You know, it's making me feel like I can't actually get up and go for a walk. I can't get up and go for a jog again. Like, you know, because I've had to give up a bit of physical activity again until I get into remission this way, this way um, or the next few weeks, hopefully. So it is, yeah, it's, it's tough. It is, it is incredibly tough where you have to actually try and not everyone will be able to sit down and say, okay, am I depressed or am I not? You know, um, but it's a case of if you can, you know, as Susan said, it's just framing your thoughts and actually seeing, you know, what way is there a lot, is there more negativity than positive than positive thoughts and their kind of a bit of gratitude, stuff like that. If you're able to identify that you are happy for what you have around you, you know, take, it's, I almost say it's like taking yourself out of the situation and just seeing what is around you. And are you happy with that? Or do you feel happy about that? You know, if you just take, say, the illness of your body, like if you were just to put your mind that way and say, sit down okay I'm actually just a normal person that's the way I view it um nothing going on in my body if I didn't have whatever illness it is am I actually you know how do I feel about life how do I feel about myself and that that's just what I actually did and I was able to say yeah I'm actually a lot more you know you could say 90% happy yeah there's that 10% there that's just the way that my brain was able to yeah. to process it you know which is tough for people to do but that's just what I had to do recently I feel to um yeah to be able, be able to differentiate between I think yeah. yeah I think that's a really helpful way to describe I guess sort of Susan sort of talking about the theoretical bit but you're saying actually this is what it might look like you sort of do sit down and have a bit of a conversation with yourself in a way and as you say it's trying to to kind of explore that a bit and as you say Victoria meant that might be really tricky for some people as well and I guess what you know we could always say yeah it, it's it's not necessarily an easy kind of inquiry but cer certainly no. something worth kind and of I think especially someone who's who might be newly diagnosed to chronic yeah. illness as well yeah you know I'm I'm 24 years down the line so I'm mm -hmm. I've been around the block and I've been through a lot of different scenarios with a chronic illness and again as I said another one kind of thrown my way so it's a case of um you know I do it is it, the experience comes in well as you get older, I feel, and yeah. the longer you've had, you have had something, because I do think that everyone does find their own way to cope, some yeah. way, shape or form, somehow. Um, it's just a matter of, I think, it's having the patience as well, to, which can be hard, because some days it's like, I just want this to be better and I want to be able to cope better, And but patience is a virtue, as I always say, and it, do, it does it does, um, it does help. Yeah, and I guess maybe to kind of support in that kind of inquiry or observation, it might be conversations that people have with their medical team. So certainly mm -hmm. myself and Susan would have worked in Vincent's and, and psychologists are attached to many of the specialties in hospitals. So I'd really encourage people um to to talk about it with your consultant you know see so and that's tricky too I'm not saying that's not necessarily easy but there I guess there's more of a growing understanding that mental health kind of impacts chronic conditions and the fact that, that there are psychologists in hospitals sort of speaks to the reality of that so it's sort of or maybe even speaking to a GP or speaking to someone that you you have a good relationship with you can say actually yeah I don't know things maybe I'm struggling a bit like the kind of my condition's not great but also I'm not feeling that great in myself either and being able to kind of get that support Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe ties into some of the questions that we've got coming in around, um, I suppose, kind of how you might cope with um, other people's understanding of the condition. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a question here about kind of how important kind of provision of peer support is to those with a chronic condition, which I would say a short answer, very. But I think we could speak uh, to that a bit more. So I wonder maybe, maybe Susan, do you want to say a bit about kind of communication in, in that piece and the kind of and support more generally? And then I'll come back to you, Victoria. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, it comes up in every conversation that I have with people. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important that it's coming up here today as well, because it is one of the areas that people struggle most with. Others, my relationship with others, how I communicate with others, be it partners or work or children or a medical team. Um, and and I think that the question really relates to you know, how do I deal with others understanding? Uh, is that right, Susan, of my, of my condition? Yeah. Um, so, I, and I suppose the really important piece is that, like, we come in to a chronic health condition, whatever age we are, um, with a particular role, 
you know, so we may be the caregiver, we may be the organizer, we may be the person who brings the crack, you know, we come in with a particular relation to other people. And, and as I said, with change for ourselves, we don't like change, but other people don't like change either. So the fact that this has happened um, means that that role is likely going to change. So maybe you don't have the energy or the capacity to be the organizer. Maybe you are so fatigued and low in energy and feeling really low emotionally and actually to engage in things that you enjoy or to be able to be lighthearted, it, it, it's too difficult. Um, so I think one of the things is that that really it's a lot to navigate the relationship and the role changes that we have. And often we don't choose them and we didn't want them, but we're left with a responsibility to kind of deal with them. Um, and I think that people often say to me that they didn't get the support from people that they would have expected to get it from. So some people that they thought would show up and be really good kind of disappeared. And other people that they didn't expect to be good supports kind of came online. Um, and, and so I suppose, and I don't like to put the onus back on the individual, but I suppose this conversation is also about what can I do to empower myself in living with a chronic health condition? So I think there's a role for us as a society and us as psychologists as well to educate and, and patients as well to educate teams um, and to educate other people. Um, but, and I think there's an onus on, on family and supporters as well to educate themselves on, on the particular chronic health condition you have and how that might impact you. But I suppose at an individual level, what you can do is really look at, look, what do I need? What kind of support do I need? How have I changed and how might that impact on how I can be in relationships? So I think at the center of it, really having a good idea for the person themselves about what they need from other people. I think it's really important as well to nearly expect that people will let you down, that people won't get it right. And um, because sometimes I think when we have a high expectation of what's going to be delivered or what we're going to get back, we have a big fall then if it doesn't happen. So I think there can be something helpful in, in kind of being light in our expectations of others. Um, and maybe even in terms of communication, looking at the circles of support that we have. So looking at the people who we want to give lots of information to the people who we want to have intimate conversations with, but also knowing that this is our information, you know, it's personal to you and you can decide how much or how little you want to give to other people. So I'd often kind of speak to people about nearly having stock phrases ready to go when communicating with others. So just kind of having, you know, and even practicing that in the mirror sometimes so that you're not taken off guard and you're not sharing additional vulnerability if that's not something that you want to do. So really thinking about your needs, holding expectations of others lightly, expecting that they'll get it wrong educating them if you feel able to um, and not expecting yourself to communicate with everybody at the same level so really differentiating your comfort levels with that mm -hmm. absolutely no that is true because I think when you're going through chronic illness I mean it, it's it's not just you it is the people around you as well whether it's family caregivers um, partners kids friends whoever it might be you know um, co-workers but at the end of the day it's you and it's you only going through this, you know, go, go physically feeling everything, you know. Um, and I think obviously anyone with a chronic illness, you are vulnerable. You know, you're vulnerable in, in your lowest times when you're when you're in a flare. You know, you could be after getting a really bad diagnosis, whether it's terminal, whatever it might be. Um, it, it's just very, so that's why I all it was a case of always just as Susan said, you don't have to give the world of information to everyone. It's what you're comfortable with. I was always an open book, but at the same time, I still wouldn't be giving every single person that I came across all of the information because I found it very wearing and taxing on me as well. You know, to have to keep repeating over and over. It could be someone I was friends with that I hadn't seen in six months and have to go back through it again. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm just not there today. You know, it's only do what feels right for you. Um, but navigating relationships can, can be tough, you know, um, and it, it can be incredibly tough with a chronic illness. You know, it's no matter how good a support network it, that you might have, it is still tough. I mean, I hate it. But I found when I, especially when I was younger, if someone asked me, are you OK? People couldn't ask me that question. I hated that question so much. But that's all my family were asking because, you know, it was just that worry 
And it's, it's just an automatic thing you would ask. You know, my mom could come into the bedroom. Are you okay? It's like, and I'd say, don't ask me that again. I'm fine. Just don't. And I mightn't be fine, but I'd be like, I'm fine. Leave me alone. It's just that irritability kind of comes into it a small bit. And it's like, I'm fine. Leave me alone. Um, but it is, it, it, it is very, very tough to, to navigate through relationships at times when, when you have a chronic illness. It can be. Yeah. I, I think just to, to follow up on something you said there, Victoria, that I think is so important because I'm conscious the people joining us today might be patients themselves, but they might also be the partner or support mm -hmm. person. And and actually, uh, I work a lot in oncology, but we know from the research as well that the distress level can actually be the same, if not higher, mm -hmm. um, in the person mm -hmm. that's, that's a partner over supporting someone with a chronic illness. So you're not just navigating like the communication needs and the distress of one person, but, but both people might be really struggling with that. And yeah. both people might have very different ways of coping with it. Mm -hmm. You know, some one person might like to talk through everything, whereas the other person might want to avoid those kind of conversations and just be more practical in their coping style. So often it's kind of going, look, geez, even with these really distinct different coping styles, how do we kind of come to some sort of understanding of what yeah. the other person needs in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And, and having kind of conversations around that, mm -hmm. isn't there, and kind of navigating that. There's there's a lot in it, isn't there? And I guess there's kind of questions coming through of how you might support someone maybe with a chronic illness who might also be kind of prone to low mood or difficulties with kind of anxiety. Um, so sort of thinking through that as well, It's it makes me think of it's kind of to go back a bit to what you're saying there, Victoria, it's a bit like coming out or something, isn't it? So it's sort of you kind of do it as you navigate through new situations or new relationships and, and they're going to change and, and vary over time too. And I really, really echo what you would say. It's about kind of what giving as much information that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So people might ask for a lot of information or people might come with a, an assumption about the condition that they did there. And I guess that's sort of wanting to try to connect on some level and try to kind of support in a way so I suppose it's really being mindful of as we said our kind of our own ways of coping and responding and, and other people's too and, and again and kind of bringing that sort of compassion to it it's it's hard isn't it they're hard yeah. conversations there to have and they're hard things to, to kind of get your head around um yeah just, and I think that people who you know who are going through the illness themselves it can be hard at times to put yourself in the other person's shoes as caring for you, you know, and it yeah. can be, can be incredibly difficult, you know, and it's a case of, I think again, just as I've gotten older, it's, that's what I would tend to do is like, okay, if I do feel snappy or feeling like that, it's, I'm given my moment and then it's afterwards then I'm like, okay, sit down and have a chat. I'm like, sorry about that earlier. You know, you know, I was just uh, in a bad mood or whatever it might've been. Um, but it's, it, it is tough. And I think as well, you know, for someone whose body might've changed physically in any, in whatever way it might be with a chronic illness, you know that that does raise more you know people are more inquisitive you know what happened you know what how, how are you how are you coping you know with you know with whatever it might be that's after happening and you know again I I've often found myself shutting down and saying I'm fine it's grand like you know it's not that I wouldn't welcome the whole you know but it's just again you might be ready at the time and that's completely fine you know if you're not ready then you're not ready you know and then when you are you are you know yeah. yourself yeah yeah you're entitled to not give yeah. any more information than, than you feel exactly. okay to give yeah and that's completely okay isn't it? it is yeah yeah, yeah. and I think, I think that's one of the pieces that like having like with chronic health conditions some of it might be invisible yeah and people might not know all that you're struggling with in terms of energy or in terms of mm -hmm. you know kind of internal symptoms that you know pain and things like that mm -hmm. whereas where some of the the kind of signs and symptoms, they're more visible to other people so I guess that kind of question of how do I support someone um mm -hmm. it, it, I, I think it is I think it's really tricky um but I think that a couple of things that people find really helps is that if people are going to support them be specific about what you're going to do particularly at times where maybe someone is really not able to engage in their life in a full way where they're really unwell you know be specific and offer offer something that you can consistently do and I think just one of the things that I hear people say often is you know people have been very very positive or very optimistic 
um, or you know that that can be really really difficult or saying god you're looking great and the person feels absolutely awful and mm-hmm. um, so I think that that can lead to a little bit of a mismatch sometimes uh, where people can kind of feel invalidated you know like I might look okay but, but that's not how I feel and um, so I think really for people who are trying to support someone like asking open-ended questions mm-hmm. not kind of jumping in with fix it or solutions or saying how, how you perceive the person but but like kind of giving that space and that openness and even that kind of you know inviting people to things still like you know I, I, you know I'm holding you in mind I'd like you to come but I completely understand if you can't so I think kind of holding that piece of still holding the person in mind still including them but also that understanding of their condition that that might not always be possible and that that's okay too mm-hmm. yeah yeah I guess that urge we all have it don't we to to fix it and to yeah. to make it better as, as you were saying a minute ago there it's it's kind of a strong pull but that sort of I think as you sort of started off and Victoria as you kind of touched into there's there's an allowing both for the person and also the as, as if you're supporting someone allowing some of that and kind of allowing it to, to kind of go through whilst kind of being open and curious to what's happening for the person mm-hmm. certainly in inflammatory bowel disease or in other conditions is this idea that invisibility is really key okay. isn't it so and and I don't know what you think about this Victoria but it's so important to yeah as you say Susan to keep inviting people to stuff just because and I suppose it can be really difficult I think it, with the the nature of a chronic condition as we said at the beginning that you can kind of it can be sort of symptoms can be okay or you might be going through periods where symptoms are very active you might not always get a huge warning to that so something that's in the diary for a month's time the day before is just not going to be doable but that's not because you're unreliable or you didn't want to go so it's really trying to and and I guess it can be a lot of difficulty around that too of kind of having committed to something and it not being possible so certainly I guess if you are kind of in a a group of friends are still kind of always asking again you know and kind of with that caveat that it's there is a bit of uncertainty in it and I suppose if you're the person who's not able to get to that event again kind of navigating through that can be that can be quite difficult so that's where the kind of communication can kind of come in too in as much as feels okay and depends Mm -hmm. on the the relationships and I don't know if you want to say a bit to that Victoria because I think it comes up so much that sort of the unpredictability and and maybe the invisibility of a lot of conditions that people maybe just yeah um because as you say ibd um even lupus other things you know they're plus is the invisible yeah you can tell sometimes if someone is or it depends on the type of flare someone is having you know you might either lose a lot of weight or you could be pumped full of steroids again then when you're going into back into remission so you're blushing so it's it's very up and down and it's just communication is key to be honest you know and i get that there's days where you just don't want to talk to anyone you don't want to have to explain and i do i do feel a lot of people are of the mindset of you know I shouldn't have to explain myself to anyone and that's com- that's that's true you shouldn't have to explain yourself to anyone but I do think that about it's just keeping the the, commun- the lines of communication open with your nearest and dearest at least you know yeah you don't need to splash your your news all over social media like what's going on with you um if you don't want to but it's just about just keeping the lines of communication open with you with your nearest and dearest that that is vital you know especially because you are vulnerable and again you are going to go through the ebbs and flows of you might feel fine one month you might be bad again the next month or whatever it might be it could be more frequent for some others it might be a lot less frequent for, for others but the time will come again where something will probably arise again where you don't feel well you're going through tests whatever it might be um and it can be tough but it's you know for some people who might just have a youth support network that's fine if you want to discuss with everyone but you know I just found for myself it was the case of it was my immediate family my closest friends um and yeah if if people ask me questions going forward that's fine but I think it was I always I was never I always got through everything my say with myself and my support network I, I was never one for advertising stuff around the place but until this year I feel um because I think that you know IBD in particular is so predominant that I just wanted to bring more awareness to it that and even just living with a chronic illness you know so this is my time after coming out of you know having everything held in for the last 20 or 23 years you could say you know into my 24th year um but it is massively important and um, when you're vulnerable to actually don't shut people out you know and it's easy you might have your days where you do of course you know you might have your weeks where you do but don't shut people out um permanently you know it's it's very important even if it's a case of talking to someone for five minutes of a day that can help you know yeah. um, even if it helps you for an hour that day so be it that's what I found if it helped me for an hour and I was down for the rest of the time then there's always the next day the next day might be a better day you know it's just 
okay, tomorrow is a new day. You know, if tomorrow is the same, there's next week. You know, there is, there is, I always say there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There really, really is. It's just a matter of just looking for it and finding it somehow. And I think that by keeping the, an open channel of communication with your support network can help pull you through that tunnel towards the light. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and I think that's really well said, Victoria. I think and kind of holding that in mind that, and I guess that, there's there's there is that light at the end of the tunnel that's coming through into that state of equilibrium as we said or actually even maybe um kind of growth or or kind of excelling in in the life that you have and there's a question there that maybe kind of ties into that i know we're sort of coming up to time there's loads that we haven't spoken about that i really want to but unfortunately we're a bit strapped for time but this question maybe ties into a, a question more broadly about kind of meaning and, and kind of having the life that you want with the chronic condition. So this question is kind of more specifically how to adjust to not being able to do the things that you used to be able to do. And I think that's really key actually, because that comes up so much. Yeah. So I suppose maybe Susan, I'll go to you about that sort of idea about living, yeah, kind of living well and kind of meaning and then mm -hmm. kind of coming back. Yeah, yeah, I think it's so important. I mean, we, I think Victoria touched a lot on the experience of grief and loss, um, and and that's that's a hugely common theme. Whatever chronic condition people are living with, the loss of being able to maybe exercise, the loss of being able to be a parent in the way you want to be, mm -hmm. the loss of relationships, the loss of maybe being able to work um at a level you want to or or are used to, or being able to maybe cut across all these things and do everything. Um, and the reality of it is that often with a chronic health condition, people may not be able to live their life the way it was before. Um, and I think there's a, a real importance of allowing people time and space to process that. And that loss will, will keep showing up and that grief will likely, likely keep coming up. And I suppose the important question is, well, how do I live my life then in parallel um, when, when these losses are present and, and when things need to change? And so I think it, it comes back to thinking about what matters um, and what do I value? And I think Victoria said it really well in terms of the last year of her life, that where she's been talking and, and being more front and focal and thinking about, you know, supporting others and bringing awareness to IBD you know so that's a real value and and so I suppose it's maybe I can't do things how I did them before but what was it that really mattered to me about doing that particular thing mm -hmm. so maybe if we think about an example of something like parenting no maybe I can't go down I can't play football with my child like I did before I can't attend all of, all of the performances that I did before but what mattered about that okay well what mattered was that I wanted to be present and I wanted to show care and I want to show up. So how can I still keep those things and still live by my values, even if they have to look differently than they did before? And I think for people, if we if there is one thing you can do to help support that is to really think about what do I value? What really, really matters to me in life? How do I want to be? How do I want to show up? Um, and how do I want to be remembered? And if we can kind of start there and then tease apart, OK, maybe I can't do it in the way I did it before, but there are ways I can still do it. And that will feel a lot better than not doing it at all. Absolutely. And I can resonate with that because I, I, I always wanted I was just always naturally kind of caring and I wanted to be a clinician. And then as I was getting you know I was going through my teenage years and I was saying okay if, I, if I'm in flares and I was in hospital a lot and it's like okay if I become a doctor I'm going to be working in a hospital and then when I'm in a flare I'll be in the hospital so I'll be living in a hospital that 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 can't work for me nursing can't work for me so I was like how can I do it so then I went to kind of social science social kind of care route and it was like okay so I can help others this way did work in that for a few years did you know I got my uh, degree and then I had to have my surgery and some of that work was a bit strenuous so on the body and it was a case of okay I had to give that up and I did get down I was like okay I've no okay so I couldn't do what I initially wanted to do when I was growing up then I went to college did four years that's down the drain what do I do now you know when I got when I got the bag and it was like what do I do now so then I decided to go into health research and I was like okay that's another way of helping us so that that's what it was it was just what did I value and I just wanted to help others somehow so that's what exactly Susan what I kind of had to sit down and do and like okay think about what did I want to do you know I want to help others how can I do it now you know and that's just the way that it just naturally flowed so you know my CV is a mix of god knows everything 
But, it, you know, it, it was still a way of getting to the core of what I actually valued and wanted to do. And that was to help others, you know, and it was the same. I had to give up playing sport, you know, and it was a case of what can I do to keep active? And so then it was like, OK, so I can't play basketball anymore. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'll go for a walk. I can't I can't really walk right now either at my joints. But um, it's a case of, you know, it's it is finding that value. And as you say, and, and again, even for me, I would love to have had kids. I've, I've, I've had four miscarriages. You know, it's a case of, is that down to, there's still questions of, is that due to what my body has gone through? Is it due to lupus? Is it what is it due? So there's still question marks over that. And it's just, I, I've kind of resigned to the fact of, it's almost something, grieving something that you haven't exactly become yet, which is a mother for me. And it's a case of, I may never be. So I've just had to, again, rethink of what my life would look like without children. You know, and the way that I look at it, I can travel, I can do this, I can do that. So it's almost filling time that you might have done, you know, spent with kids is how can I fill my time as I get older, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just about sitting down and reevaluating. And as you say, Susan, people don't like change, but living with a chronic illness, change is, is, is the number one thing that, you know, you have to be flexible and adaptable basically to be able to continually kind of be open to your life changing during the different stages, you know, which is, which is tough. But then again, it's just, but always, I always say, always allow yourself to feel every single emotion as you go through, you know, you really have to, because you'd be better off in the long run for it, you know, and again, for people who can't pull themselves out of, out of say feeling down or whatever it might be, whether it's, you know, chatting to your, your support network isn't enough. Again, the, you know, both Susans, you know, there is there's you guys to help as well you know it's, it's not being afraid to ask for help you know and I think that's vital never be afraid to ask for help yeah I think that's so key Victoria thank you and and Victoria thank you for sharing your experiences I have no doubt what you've said here today and in other settings has been hugely helpful to people to to hear actually what it feels like and to go through it and to see you kind of come out through some very difficult times and and kind of Keep still on. going and, <laughs> and, but, and living a really yeah. good life and as you say kind of re-evaluating and always growing and developing and mm. I don't know about you Susan but certainly my experience of of kind of supporting people has been that a real kind of a, a real a deep respect I think I have for people who kind of can adapt and have that flexibility and continually evolving and we don't like change and you're faced with change with the chronic condition all the time and unexpected and unpredictable changes. So it's, I guess it's a huge testament to, to kind of continuing and keeping going and allowing and, and living a meaningful life. So thank you, Victoria, for, for speaking so openly. And, and thank you, Susan, for, for all of your insights and expertise. I think it's been a really really useful conversation and certainly I'd say we've probably only skimmed the surface of mm -hmm. the topic we we could have covered so for for people watching and who might have had questions that were more specific to some of the conditions a few had come in around long COVID um, and fibromyalgia so my apologies for not getting to the specific conditions I would definitely say um do talk to your team if you're kind of left with kind of kind of certainly questions about your own care, really, and maybe your GP too, I suppose, thinking if you only see a medical team maybe once a year or every six months and if you're, you're struggling, kind of do reach out for help, as, as Victoria says before then. So don't don't feel like you have to suffer alone or to go over to go through kind of without help. So do kind of connect in for help if, if you feel that you need that. Um, I sort of I kind of don't want to let you both go either so I don't know maybe on a very before we finish up we've got about like two minutes or so before I'll kind of talk about the next webinar but if you were to say something even in one sentence so a question for both of you what you would be most happy for someone who's given up their hour today to, to kind of listen to this webinar the, the most important thing maybe in one sentence that you would want them to take away with them so Victoria if I start with you mm -hmm. um, I would say be your own advocate first of all and I know that could be tough especially in the healthcare system the way that it could be at the moment um, always pester you know if you feel something is off with your body you know your body um yeah. listen to it and never ever give up because there is light at the end of the tunnel and life keeps going thanks victoria and susan speedy <laughs> um i think a chronic illness changes everything in your life and um, but it doesn't need to change the person that you are and the values that you hold so maybe encouraging people to connect with those and live them as best they can, even in the midst of a chronic health condition. Yeah, beautifully said, both of you. Thank you so much for the conversation today. Really, really appreciate your time. Thanks for everyone for listening in. Um, our webinar next month is going to be myself and Lucy Johnston talking about the social um, and 
uh, understanding mental health difficulties within the context of psychological and social factors. So if you can join us then, please do. Thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, thanks to our panel again and see you next month. Thank you. Thanks everyone.